All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to see folks filtering in uh, on this beautiful summer day. Uh, we'll get started in about 30 seconds. Uh, we're just going to let folks at home finish up their lunch or wrap up their gardening projects or whatever it is they're taking a break from to come join us. Uh, really, really appreciate folks taking time um, to be with us today. We're so excited about this uh, topic and the wonderful guests that we have. Um, so another 10 seconds or so, uh, and then we'll jump right in. Um, again, just thank you so much for, uh, for being with us. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, welcome, and uh, we appreciate all of you joining us today for part one of Fresh Energy's Energy Plus webinar series. I'm Justin Fay, Senior Lead of Public Affairs and Advocacy here at Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a Minnesota-based nonprofit working toward a vision of a just, prosperous, and resilient future powered by a shared commitment to a carbon neutral economy. Energy and climate issues play out across our society in books and film, institutions of higher learning, our democracy, and in the very air we breathe. Voting rights and civic engagement are two of the most impressive, uh, pressing issues of our time. Today, we're gonna discuss how community engagement intersects with action on climate and justice. Before we get too far along, I wanna take a moment to thank our generous event sponsors who helped make this webinar series possible. Thank you to Great River Energy for joining us as a gold sponsor and to Sunrun for joining us as a bronze sponsor. I also want to extend a shout out and thank you to all of our promotional partners. And I see some of you in the, in the, the participant list here today uh, who helped spread the word about this event. I think this list is longer than it has ever been in the three years we've been running this series and we're so grateful for these partnerships. We're very excited to be joined today by the senior senator from the state of Minnesota, U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar, Minnesota Secretary of State Steve Simon, and our amazing panelists, Dr. Gabe Chan from the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, Dominic McQuarrie from the McKnight Foundation, and Carolina Ortiz from Copal. We'll be meeting our panelists in a few moments, but right now, I want to kick off our webinar with a special welcome message from U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar, one of the Senate's leading champions for voting rights. Hello to everyone attending the Fresh Energy webinar series on energy and democracy. Thanks for inviting me to say a few words today. Over the last few decades, your organization has done critical work to forge a better, cleaner future. From conferences and expos to publications and advocacy, you were there when the Secretary of Energy came into town with Tina and me and so many others. You've consistently been on the front lines of the fight for climate action, and today, you're bringing together our state's brightest energy policy minds to develop thoughtful solutions to get us to that clean energy future. Your work is so important because in recent years, we've seen the true impact of climate change, devastating wildfires, massive hurricanes, huge tornadoes. Every time we hear this is the storm of a century, Mother Nature says, hold my beer. This spring, Northeast Minnesota experienced both, by the way, some of the worst fires Remember that smoke? And then the worst flooding it's seen in almost 70 years, impacting so many communities and businesses in the process. A few weeks ago, I visited Kuchichin County, where recent flooding has caused serious damage to people's homes, as well as significant delays in essential services. We've seen it in the farmlands. We've seen it in southern Minnesota. Your advocacy is essential because the climate crisis isn't happening in 100 years. It's happening now. There is a scientific consensus that in order to avoid the worst effects of climate change, we will need to achieve 100% net zero emissions no later than 2050. That's why in the Senate, I've been focused on transforming our energy sector and unlocking the next big scientific breakthroughs on climate. With this potential upcoming reconciliation bill, how long have Tina and I have been working on this, we will have a chance to make sweeping investments in clean energy by including long-term direct pay tax credits for solar production and investment. I thank Tina for her leadership on her important work. I am focused on getting this done. 
whether we do it with legislation, whether we do it with rulemaking, the president's executive orders, whether we do it on the state basis local, we cannot let huge opportunities to invest in our future slip through our fingers. I'm also leading many bills on my own. In May, I introduced legislation called the Heater Act to help more people transition to heat pumps. We know that we can just get the cost down. Heat pumps have the potential to play a central role in our clean energy future. So my bill is about making this happen. We're going to get momentum behind our efforts. In fact, the White House just came out and endorsed the bill. So as you could say, heat pumps are truly gaining steam. I have to get some dorky energy joke in there. Last year, we passed my bipartisan leg legislation with Senator John Hoven to help nonprofits that miss out on some of our existing tax incentives cover the cost of energy efficiency upgrades. We got that done. But we also know there's so much more work that must happen to tackle the threat of climate change. We need to keep promoting renewable energy solutions and developing energy to efficient technologies. Commit ourselves to that net zero emissions by 2050. We must move ahead. One more thing I wanted to talk with you about today, and that is the importance of voting in addressing our environmental crisis. As chair of the Senate Rules Committee, which oversees federal elections, I'm focused on making sure every American can cast a ballot in a way that's easiest for them regardless of their zip code. That's why I led the Freedom to Vote Act and got every single Democrat in the Senate to support it. We lost out because of the filibuster, and I think you know that I would change that. But I do not believe we should give up, because when voters make their voices heard at the ballot box, our planet wins. After Americans went to the polls and voted in record numbers to elect leaders who shared your commitment to a clean energy future, we've seen transformative investments in clean energy. And we've been able to confirm dozens of judges, as well as soon to be Justice Jackson, who understand the importance of following the law, including our environmental rules. This matters because the rules that protect clean air and clean water only really have meaning when they're enforced in court. So the voting matters, the judges matter, and of course the work you're doing advocating for legislation matters. These just aren't words on a page. And coming from the land of over 10,000 lakes and more than 90,000 miles of river, we know that impact firsthand. I'm proud of the progress we've made. I recognize that more action is needed as we continue to confront the climate crisis. Advocates like you are already playing a crucial role in pushing us forward on climate. Thanks for your tireless work. I'm confident that together we can ensure a better, cleaner future for our state, country, and planet. Enjoy the rest of the webinar. You deserve it. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar, for sending us your video and for your leadership in support of voting rights and action to protect our climate. Now, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Minnesota's 22nd Secretary of State, Steve Simon, who was first elected in 2014 after previously serving in the Minnesota House of Representatives. As Secretary of State, Secretary Simon partners with township, city, and county officials to organize elections on behalf of Minnesota's nearly 4 million eligible voters and to ensure that Minnesota's election system is fair. Thank you for being with us, Secretary Simon. Well, thank you so much. Can you hear me and see me okay? We certainly can. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's an honor, frankly, to be invited. You mentioned that I was in the Minnesota House of Representatives for 10 years. And I know uh, many of you, and I know um, the efforts that you've undertaken for so many years, and now is the time. I don't need to tell you, I know I'm preaching to the choir, the climate crisis is here. It's manifesting itself, as Senator Klobuchar just said, in ways that everyday people can understand. This is not theoretical, this is not academic, this is real, this is practical, this is everyday. And I know that's the message that so many of you for so long have been trying to get out there. And I'm here to tell you, despite some bad days, despite some setbacks, your work is having a positive effect. And it particularly intersects, and this is what I've been asked to be talking about, with my line of work. I like to say that I'm in the democracy business. And it is a heck of a time right now to be in the democracy business. I'm here to underscore some things that I'm sure you already realize, but that, it, that always bear repeating. 
namely the nexus and the connection between what you do and the action that you undertake on multiple levels and in, in so many different ways with the work that I do, which is making sure that um, we can protect the freedom to vote. Let me give as an example, a piece of bad news that all of you are aware of, and that is still a fresh wound I know. And that was the end of term decision by the US Supreme Court to essentially cripple the, reg the regulatory response um, to climate change. That is a blow, not just in the short term or in the medium term, but potentially in the long term. What the Supreme Court did, as I'm sure many of you are well aware, is really seriously hamper the ability of regulators to regulate. Um, but here's the good news. It need not be a long-term impediment. And I say that because ultimately Congress, elected officials in Congress, as you know, have the ability to make it right. But we're not gonna get there unless we get people in Congress who share those views or values. Put another way, I like to say to people, not just Fresh Energy, but anyone who invites me to talk, that all roads lead to the ballot box. I really and truly believe that because whether it's climate change or any other issue, we're not gonna get the results, the outcomes, the changes that we want, unless we get people into office who share our views and values. And we're not gonna get that in turn, unless we have a democracy that works, that functions, that enjoys well-earned confidence from people. Um, now, look, I, I'm the first to tell you, and you don't need me to tell you, that there are multiple ways to make change on issues of cli the climate crisis or climate justice, not just through elected representatives. And all of us are students of history to some extent. And we know that great change in this country and even in the state of Minnesota has come about through non-electoral means. But you gotta admit that uh, elect change that is brought about um, by electoral means and ultimately through legislation and government action is a huge, huge part, particularly in this area particularly in light of this U.S. Supreme Court decision last week, it is a huge, huge part of how we're gonna to get to where we know we need to go. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, how I view the lay of the land in terms of elections and our election system uh, and why it's so important. So interestingly, and you might think strangely, I am a long-term optimist about democracy in America and democracy in Minnesota. And part of the reason I feel that way is the 2020 election. I think the 2020 election for so many reasons was a stress test for our democracy. And in my judgment, Minnesota aced the test. And part of the reason why we aced the test is the way we're gonna get out of some of the problems that we see before us, namely, but not exclusively, the Supreme Court decision, which really um, struck a blow against uh, meaningful and common sense efforts to, to combat climate change. So think of where you were I don't mean physically, but your headspace two years ago from right now. Again, not where you were, what room you were in, but what you were thinking, your frame of mind two years ago in the heart of the pandemic on July 7th of 2020. I can tell you where my headspace was and all of us in our office, it was um, looking ahead to a November election in a very consequential year at the presidential level and trying to figure out how we were gonna pull this off. We were in the throes of the pandemic. Still in July, we were in shutdown and lockdown mode. And we had ourselves questioning and obviously always working to try to resolve some of the impediments and the obstacles that would be in our way of putting on a free, fair election with integrity and honesty. There were multiple challenges, obviously. Um, how, for example, were we gonna get 30,000 people to step up as we need to every year to be election judges or poll workers? Who's gonna wanna do that job? Who's gonna to wanna to sign up to be 12, 13, 14 hours in a low ceiling church basement with a thousand people on average and their droplets, by the way, circulating in and out of that space in pre-vaccine America, right? Who's gonna to wanna to do that job? Would we have conflict or even violence at the polling place? Um, and most importantly, maybe, were the voters gonna turn away rather than lean in? But fortunately in Minnesota, and this is the key part, we had the tools we had the policies, we had the laws, um, we had the norms in effect that allowed us ultimately to overcome those challenges. And let me start with the laws. That is really, really important in Minnesota because we remain one of the best states in the country when it comes to the terrain of our laws. Not perfect, there are things I and you would wanna add, there are things that I and you would wanna subtract, but overall pound for pound, 
Minnesota's uh, legal landscape is very favorable because it's very pro-voter. It's very pro-access. So we have same-day voter registration in Minnesota, something that all organizers for any cause should always take advantage of. Think about how fortunate we are. There is no cutoff period in Minnesota. In most states, if you're not registered three or four or sometimes five weeks before the election, that is it. That is the cutoff. It doesn't matter that you didn't understand the law. It doesn't matter that you forgot the law. It doesn't matter that you moved or anything else. That's it. You are out. Not so in Minnesota, where since 1973, you can go on game day, on election day to the polling place, either totally unregistered or needing to change some aspect of your registration, and you can do it right there. We have online voter registration. That too has been a, a really important addition in recent years. So you don't have to go to an office or fill out an actual piece of paper. You can do it in two or three minutes online. And the final aspect that I will um, mention is that we have um, no excuses absentee voting, meaning you can vote from the comfort of your home for any reason or no reason. It's no one's business what your reason is as long as you're an eligible voter. We passed that in 2013. Uh, I have some pride in ownership because that was uh, my bill in the Minnesota House of Representatives during my last term. And ironically, I could never have known it then in 2013. Uh, that is what ultimately saved the 2020 election in Minnesota. We went from 24% voting absentee in 2018 to 58%, not only more than doubling that number, but getting to a large majority who voted absentee. Put another way, only 42% of voters in 2020 voted the old fashioned way by going to a designated place on a designated day during a designated time. So that's ultimately what saved that election. But, and you knew there would be a but, I want to address what lurks out there as, in my mind, the number one threat and danger to our democracy right now, both nationally and in Minnesota. And that is this unrelenting wave of disinformation about our election system and about particular election contests in general. It's a problem. Uh, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. I think it will ultimately, but not anytime soon. And what I'm talking about is a coordinated political effort to sow unwarranted and unsubstantiated doubt in the fundamentals of our election system based on the result of one election that didn't go the way that some people wanted it to go. It is a huge problem. And look, let me just stop right here and say, as we would all acknowledge, this is a free country. Everyone has a right to be wrong. We have people in this country who think that Elvis is still alive or think that the moon landings were fake and that's perfectly okay. 100% of us would say, that's what America is all about. Not only can they believe those things, they can yell it from the mountaintops and we wouldn't have it any other way. But what's different about this kind of disinformation, this election disinformation, what makes it so much more concerning and toxic is what it has inspired. Because unlike those other things, Elvis and the moon landing, the people who believe these things have fomented violence. We had an attack on the United States Capitol where rioters kill people. And it's also led to attacks, in my judgment, on the freedom to vote in state capitals around the country, including in Minnesota, where on the strength of these lies and on this propaganda, people have all sorts of bad ideas about how to make voting harder for eligible voters, eligible voters, not eligible folks, but eligible voters, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family. And so what do we do about that? How do we, in the context of elections or otherwise, address disinformation? I think it's a combination of things. Number one is to always lead with the truth. Always lead with the truth. And the truth is simple to remember because here's what it is. Both the 2020 election and our, general, uh, and our, and our election system generally has been fundamentally fair, accurate, honest, and secure. Never perfect. There are things about that system that you and I would change, of course, and others would change, maybe in a different and opposite direction. But the fundamentals are that our, our elections in Minnesota are clean and they are honest. And part of the reason we know that is what happened in 2020. Because despite all those challenges, despite all those worries and all that anxiety, when the dust settled in Minnesota, you know what happened when we all pulled in the same direction? When the nonprofit sector and the public sector and the private sector when layers of government knew that the number one task in 2020 was clearing obstacles out of the path of eligible voters to make sure they didn't have to choose between their health and the right to vote, you know what happened? Minnesota for the third time in a row, third time in a row, number one in America in voter turnout. That is not an accident. That is not a coincidence. That is not dumb luck. That is not just something in the water. That is intentional. 
because you and I and many people around the state, there is broad ownership of that outcome. Many people pulled in the same direction. So we've got something to lose in Minnesota. We've got something to lose and we can't lose it. So um, that's the good news is um, uh, that, the, that the truth is that the elections were fundamentally fair, accurate, honest, and secure. So number one is always saying the truth. And I'm not naive and neither are you. Um, there are people who believe some of the disinformation and they're not just gonna stand down because I and you happen to speak the truth um, to their face. But not everyone has to do a 180 for this to work. Sometimes somebody can do an 11 or a 17 or a 23 or a 38, doesn't have to be a 180. And over time, incrementally with patients, we can make sure that um, we break the fever of disinformation. Um, number two, I think, is to realize that not everyone who repeats some of the disinformation is an intentional super spreader of it. There are good people in this country, in the state, people you and I both know, I'm sure, and interact with, who believe some, most, or all of the disinformation about our elections. And I think the important thing to do is approach with that understanding that there are good people who do the natural thing, which is it is human nature that as someone you know or like or trust or respect says something, you're more likely to agree with it or at least be inclined to believe it, whether that's a restaurant review or a recommendation of a movie to watch or whatever, that's human nature. And I think the more we can understand that there are some good people out there who are simply believing things that people they know and like and trust and respect are saying, the better it will be for all of us. And third and finally, in terms of combating disinformation, it's important for us to let the sunshine in. The more openness, the more transparency, the better. I am convinced, and the polling bears this out, the more people can come to understand or get reacquainted with the election system we have as it is, and not how it has been so falsely portrayed in recent years. The more they can do that, the better. We have the systems in place in Minnesota. We have layers of post-election reviews and audits. We have a public process where people who have doubts, for example, about the election machines and equipment can come in. You don't need to be a VIP or a big shot. You can come in off the street with no appointment and you can watch uh, county or city elections administrators kick the tires of those machines to make sure that everything's on the up and up, that they're functioning, they're working, no one's getting in there, no one's hacking them, all the rest. I use those as just as a couple of examples of the tools we already have in place, which ought to ensure and reinsure people uh, of the well-earned confidence in our election system. So I would say this, I am a long-term optimist, but in the short and medium term, we have real deep challenges, starting and ending, in my view, with this disinformation but we have to keep our eye on the ball. We have to keep our eyes on the prize, which is making sure we have an election system that functions so that anyone in Minnesota can say um, that there's a clear path to getting people into public office who share their views and values. I wanna thank you for your time. I wanna thank you for your attention. I wanna thank you for everything you do on climate issues in particular, sounding the alarm where it needs to be sounded and um, engaging people on every level in the state of Minnesota. Thank you for that work. And maybe most importantly, thank you for being a partner of mine in the democracy business. I wish you the best, always. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Secretary. It's really an honor to have you as part of our event today. We know you're busy uh, and have to get back to the work of doing the democracy business. Uh, so we're gonna let you go uh, with our thanks and appreciation. And now I'd like to turn to our panel of experts to dig a little deeper into how voter engagement, voting rights, and democracy intersects with action on climate and justice. Welcome to our panelists. I'm joined today by Dr. Gabe Chan. Dr. Chan is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and he's a bit of a rock star in the clean energy world here in Minnesota and the Midwest. Gabe's research examines policies to stimulate innovation in energy technologies and mitigate global climate change in the United States, China, and internationally. Welcome to Carolina Ortiz. Carolina is the Associate Executive Director at COPAL and has been with the organization since it was founded in 2018. Carolina was born in Zacatecas, Mexico, Mexico and is currently studying communications and women's studies in Minnesota. A dreamer herself, her passion for social justice stems from her own experiences and those of her community. And finally, welcome to Dominic McQuarrie, program officer with the Vibrant and Equitable Communities and Midwest Climate and Energy Programs at the McKnight Foundation. 
where he oversees and develops innovative grant portfolios at the intersection of McKnight's climate and equity goals with an emphasis on strengthening democratic participation and civic engagement. So I've been looking forward to this discussion since we first came up with the topic of energy and democracy last winter. Let's dig in. Uh, and why don't we start with you, uh, with uh, you, Gabe. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and your role at the Humphrey School and how in your classroom you've been exploring how civic engagement intersects with action on uh, energy and justice? Yeah, thanks, Justin, and, and thanks to Fresh Energy for organizing this uh, amazing panel. Uh, I've been uh, at the faculty, uh, on the faculty of the Humphrey School for uh, about eight years now, uh, teaching and researching in our program on science, technology, and environmental policy. I have the amazing privilege to work with students who are pursuing graduate degrees in public affairs. These students are coming to our program uh, because they're passionate about making an impact uh, and want to serve the public good. And you know, I teach our introductory statistics class and we do a lot of theory and methods in that. But I think our students really come to the school to try to practice learning by doing in our program. And so what this looks like as we think about civic engagement and energy transition is uh, working with students to become public participants in public utility commission dockets, supporting analysis for the legislature uh, and working with state and local government agencies. But I think one thing that I've started to really appreciate and learn and see change in is where energy transition is happening and who's really uh, building that opportunity for civic engagement energy transition. And I think this has looked like working with a lot of community-based organizations as they seek to engage their local communities in these big changes to build capacity and to grapple with a lot of complexity in energy policy. And so increasingly, I think that civic engagement in energy transition means going well beyond the highly structured energy policy decision making. It looks like engaging local governments, neighborhood associations, faith based organizations, regional development commissions and other groups that are working at that real grassroots level. And so to come back to you know, what what do our students think about, I think they're thinking about engagement in such a different way that democracy has to start at that grassroots level, particularly if we want to work towards an equitable energy transition. And so I think Voting is an absolutely a critical part. Political organizing is a critical part. Engaging elected and appointed officials is a critical part. But I think it also has to involve community-based organizations, nonprofits, local organizations. And all these organizations are where action on energy justice is taking place. And in our classroom, we're trying to now think about really creatively, how do we build those skills for students to be able to engage in these new ways? Thank you. Uh, we've certainly uh, uh, had the chance to meet a, a number of your students and folks coming out of the program at Fresh Energy, and um, it's, it's always been a really wonderful, impressive, uh, inspiring experience. Um, I think maybe now we could segue a little from the classroom to uh, you know, uh, practice uh, on the ground. Uh, Carolina, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Copal? And Copal's focus on civic participation and leadership as well as building the Latino vote. In your opinion, are voters in the Latino community making the connection between clean energy issues and climate? Thank you, Justin. That is a loaded question. So I will try my best to explain or answer it as best as I can. But my name is Carolina Ortiz and I was born in Zacatecas, Mexico, which great job pronouncing it by the way, because it's not easy. Um, and my family migrated to actually directly to Minnesota when I was two years old. So Minnesota has been my, my home since then. And luckily, I was one of the people who were able to apply for DACA back in 2012. And that's how I was able to actually have a more dignified life, um, be able to work, be able to um, rent. So it was life changing for sure. And my story, I think, is, is really an example of why Copal started to begin with back in 2018. I knew that I couldn't vote myself but I wanted to be civically engaged. I want, I was like, I have to do something, right? I need to do something in order to motivate the people who can vote to participate. And also the people who can't to also 
take action like myself. And that's how I started at Copal. It was really a way for me able to take action. And I started helping out with citizenship classes. I started doing everything I could possibly do to change the, the way that the elections were looking like back in 2018. Um, and really that's when I started having conversation with elected officials. I started working with other students as Gabe mentioned um, in classes and how can we connect the community to talk and get to know the people who are making the choices of you know, the decisions that are being made in the places that we live. So I think again, Copal, is actually stands for Communities Organizing Power and Action for Latinos. And that is exactly what we are doing and what we have been doing for these past few years. Um, also, to your question about if the community is aware, I think they're aware because they're being directly impacted. People are having asthma. People are, you know, we're, we're seeing all these things, like they mentioned before, things that are day to day, but I think it's it's hard to make the connection between how do we change it, right? How do we uh, make those bold moves? How do we hold our representatives accountable? So I think people are seeing the effects because they're living every day with them. But I think Gopal now wants to make sure that we work with our community to take action. Thank you. Um, Rush Energy is so uh, grateful for the opportunities to partner with Gopal on uh, important issues, including public awareness around fossil fuel in our homes. Uh, and we also strongly support Copal's work on these crucial democracy issues that affect us all. So thank you so much. Uh, now, Dominic, in your role at McKnight, I imagine you sometimes take the 10,000 foot view of building democracy in our society. Can you talk a little bit about your role at McKnight and the goals of your team's democracy work within the Midwest Climate and Energy Program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and before I do that, I, I just want to shout out Fresh Energy and Copal as wonderful partners to us. And you know, I think it's going to be a core. Of some of what I'm going to say is that uh, you know we don't really have good work going on if we don't have strong partners doing the work on the ground at this intersection of climate and democracy. So I'm just very honored all the time when you know I get to be in partnership with you all. Um, so as you know, you laid out sort of at the top, I, I sit across our two largest programs here at McKnight, Vibrant Echo Communities and Midwest Climate and Energy. And really um, it was born out of the recognition that without uh, a strong democracy and a really engaged uh, civic population, uh, we weren't going to accomplish any of our goals related to creating a more equitable Minnesota or decarbonizing the Midwest and, you know, addressed uh, an equitable way. And, um, you know, uh, uh, on your point about the 10,000 foot view of building democracy in society, you're absolutely right, Justin. Uh, it's one of the luxuries of uh, being in philanthropic work and not tied as strongly to some of the legislative budgetary uh, political cycles as other folks um, that we can sort of take a step back, take the 10,000 foot, the long term view. Um, and that's, that's a huge tool, but something I want to be really cognizant about, and I'm about nine months in my role and new to philanthropy uh, as well and trying to keep myself grounded is that if we're up at that 10,000 foot view all of the time, and especially if we're up there alone, then we're probably losing actual perspective on how to be the most effective partners in the ecosystem. So we need to make sure that we're bringing our partners like Fresh Energy and Copal up to that 10,000 foot view because uh, you are so often with your heads down doing the work, doing the good work. Um, and then also making sure that we are on the ground with you all hearing, learning, seeing, um, and you know, and listening most importantly, rather than just sort of sitting up at that higher level view. And I think a really emblematic way to think about it is we talk a lot about ecosystems here uh, at McKnight. It's one of those philanthropic words I feel like that we have. Um, and for me, it's just really important that when we think about ecosystems and talk about ecosystems, we're not the funder looking down at an ecosystem, but actually that we're recognizing that we are in the ecosystem, we're a part of it, and that our actions or inactions uh, in different directions have impacts the same as our grantee partners, our strategic partners, and those um, others who are in the work. So just the final point, uh, Justin, as, as we're thinking about 
the work here at McKnight, um, one thing that we've heard over and over is just how difficult some of these cycles around these democratic touch points, be it voting or census or redistricting are. Um, and the Secretary of State was really great about laying out the importance of, of voting and activity but we know that some of these systems are set up in these boom and bust cycles and also as a place based funder and a partner, how can we be working to ensure that we have an infrastructure that can be working every single day. Um, not just showing up the last few months or weeks before elections or some of these big events, but actually building power sophistication and energy um, around a strong civic population and not just you know yes, high voter turnout, but there's so much more that can be accomplished if we're thinking about and supporting democracy every single day. That's, that's really great. Um, so I'd like to move on now to talking about uh, building or uh, maybe perhaps rebuilding our statewide system to ensure that all Minnesotans have a say in the big policy decisions that are made at the Minnesota legislature, uh, at state agencies, at the local level, and, and uh, elsewhere, elsewhere in civic society. Uh, Dominic, I think McKnight calls this building civic infrastructure. Uh, and, and, and in a nutshell, it's, it's about making our systems more accessible. Um, each of you with us today uh, on the panel are playing a big role in that work uh, uh, in helping build the system and building the political will and acumen among Minnesotans. Uh, Gabe, as, as you approach your research and discussions with students on both, uh, uh, with both a, a local uh, US and international lens. Um, in your experience, can you discuss how civic engagement fits in from local action to international movements? Yeah, thanks. This is a tricky question, but I think you know to start with, you know, climate change is a global problem. Greenhouse gases mix evenly in the atmosphere so that a ton of carbon emitted in Minneapolis has the same impact on climate as a ton emitted in Beijing. And so, the scope of this problem really is global. Um, and so what this means is that there are cost-effective climate solutions all across the planet, and there's significant potential uh, to collaborate and to learn from each other as we think about this. One thing I'm really happy is we've, we've worked uh, together with our Institute on the Environment here at the U to send uh, almost 30 people uh, to, from the university uh, to the climate negotiations hosted by the United Nations. When students and staff and faculty come back, oftentimes they reflect on, well, I met someone from the other side of the planet who's 20 years older than me or 20 years younger than me who are thinking about the same problem that I'm working on. And it starts to build community and a sense of, I think, international solidarity uh, to address this. Um, but while I think that the, you know, the science of climate change points to the global nature of the problem, the political problem, the governance problem is really different. It's really rooted in national governments and democratic political power. And so I think when we think about how do we build democracy to support an equitable energy transition, I think we really have to focus on that bottom up momentum building and accountability and think about how policy tools allow local action to scale and not try to look for those silver bullets of policies or technologies that can work top down. I think time and time again, we've seen approaches like the Kyoto Protocol or the Clean Power Plan even that have tried to set out large comprehensive policies and have run into political roadblocks, feasibility roadblocks, legal roadblocks, et cetera. And so grassroots action, bottom-up action continues despite I think a lot of the challenges with top-down action. And I think that's really important. I think one, you know, one other you know, tidbit here, or really important piece more than a tidbit is to build on the fact that people want to see energy transition. Right? Recent public opinion polling shows more than two in three Americans from across the political divide support prioritizing wind and solar. Even more, three in four support the US participating in global climate action. And so I think this creates a lot of potential to connect the dots between work at the grassroots level with how our leaders at higher levels of governance are thinking about this. Second there. Well, thank you, Gabe. Uh, I just uh, wanted to add too that we're just a few months away from COP27 uh, and the, the IPCC reports that came out the year, this year were certainly very sobering. 
Uh, and voters around the world are pushing their governments to do more. And in part, that's thanks to the groundwork of organizations of, around the globe and, and definitely right here at home in Minnesota. Uh, Carolina, it, it's more important than ever for every single person to be able to engage in the political process because our, uh, our everyday lives, not to mention climate and energy decisions, are steered by those who hold office. Now, Copal is doing so much to both uh, boost Latino uh, community engagement. What does Copal see as the role of community as we foster those conversations uh, with folks holding places of power? Great question. I think it there's a there's a few things. One, I feel like there's many community members that do want to engage, want to participate, but unfortunately, not everybody speaks English. And there's a lot of information out there that is not available in Spanish or other languages as well. One thing that we have done at Copal is um, taking the, the job to translate translate a lot of information, get information in languages that are accessible to our community. And that has been helpful. We actually do have um, on copalement.org on our website directly, we have information on Minnesota Latino vote. What it means is there, all the informa information that was mentioned earlier is there in Spanish as well. So I think, you know, it's just one thing that we have to, we have to see that unfortunately, there's still a lot of information out there that is not available in Spanish or other languages. Um, two, Copal is a member-based organization, so I would encourage people to become members, to help us with this work, to be curious and ask ourselves those questions. Why, why is our community getting asthma? Why are we, you know, having so much issues with, um, I don't know, just be curious, right? Be curious and ask questions and also demand. Demand as a community that we deserve better, that we need better. So I think, um, really just get involved with, with Copal, get involved, do the work with us. There are so many issues happening in regards to climate change and just climate injustice. But thankfully, you know, there are organizations such as Copal that are working on these and we need, we need our community behind us to support us. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and now moving from the, the role of communities, uh, and groups in Minnesota and across the Midwest, uh, thinking about the uh, local level, cities are creating climate action plans. And there's actually already 13 of them uh, here in Minnesota that at least that we're aware of. Uh, when we compare those to state and federal commitments, they can seem like a drop in the bucket, but they actually play a really major role. Uh, Dominic, in your view, how are engaged residents alongside advocates and community groups pushing local governments to incorporate climate and energy into their legal frameworks? Yeah, thanks for that question, Justin. And I, you know, I love that Gabe hit on it earlier about the work that his students are doing to get further and further down into the grassroots and looking for the many different sites to continue to push their advocacy and engagement because um, sometimes that's how it has to happen. Yeah, if we continue to hit roadblocks at the higher levels of government, um, we can't just you know take our ball and go home. We only have the one planet. So it's really, really heartening to see a lot of folks turning then to their local governments and saying, well, okay, maybe we haven't accomplished it at the state level, but let's start here. There is something we can do in our own backyard. Um, and I'm calling today from Minneapolis, so it's not a uh, 100% uh, truth uh, and not across 100% of the issues, but in general, sometimes, you know, there can be less partisanship, more alignment in smaller communities like a city or a town or a county where you can actually have real robust, less hot conversations about some of these issues and come towards real meaningful progress and action. And the hope is that, um, you know, drops in a bucket can, can be individual drops, but many drops in a bucket all of a sudden is starting to get heavy and maybe you're gonna to begin to overflow and we're gonna be able to push up the higher levels and, and see that action actually come to fruition. So um, I just, you know, maybe I'm echoing the Secretary of State a little bit, but I see these as real moments of optimism that people aren't taking no for an answer and can continuing to push, um, you know, local electives that then can push their county folks that then can push the state folks. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, lightning round for all three of you before we head into the uh, question and answer portion. 
Uh, with one minute each, can you tell our audience today what you see as the biggest emerging opportunity in democracy and civic engagement to get people plugged in on clean energy and climate? Uh, Gabe, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thanks. I think uh, to keep it brief, I, you know, one of my biggest concerns, and I'll flip it to an opportunity, the concern is that more democracy could also work against clean energy in some specific cases. Um, you know, despite the majority of people wanting clean energy, during, for example, uh, last month when gas prices saw a record high, there was a lot of push from both sides of the political spectrum to put in a holiday on the gas tax, which is complicated. Yes, there's a lot of really important pressures, but this kind of illustrates some of the tensions that might emerge if there's more direct accountability uh, to voters for these fixes, which may uh, have political gains with, uh, with some countervailing uh, impacts as well. So I think to flip it to the opportunity, I think the real opportunity here is to think about how clean energy policies can create real material benefits for people's lives so that they want to participate so that the opportunities that clean energy creates are benefiting directly the people who are going to be deciding on the next round of policies uh, that we need to continue momentum uh, down this pathway of transition. Great, and uh, Carolina, why don't we uh, go to you next? I think we just need to build a community movement. I think we need to incorporate community, invite community, and really work together as partners. Copal, other nonprofit organizations, other partners, work together to really meet our community where they are, build educational, informational pieces in other languages, and just be accessible. So I think really just, again, to build a, a movement that is really led by our community. Wonderful. And Dominic, well, last but not least. It's so hard going after two really smart people. Uh, um, so I, I think I want to just, you know, put a little emphasis on what Gabe talked about. And just we hear a lot about some of the changing trends and demographics. And just we all need to be really clear that these trends aren't inherently going to save us. And in your question asking about, you know, what the opportunities are, I think that's the key word that like we have this opportunity and we need action to step into that gap and opportunity. And one of the places that I'm really excited about this intersection, hopefully the increase in engagement and democracy is that folks are gonna enter into the space and they're gonna take that energy in a lot of different directions. It might not initially be climate, it could be housing or healthcare, but we all on this call know that there are many intersections between basically every other policy issue of emphasis in someone's life and climate change. So there are greater opportunities for us as the climate community to figure out what are those intersections? How do we reach out to people who are active and inspired to create change and make that connection? And it might you know, require us to step and say, oh, I need to work a little bit more on housing or figure out how to incorporate that in, but we can create a more robust and stronger overall ecosystem of actors. Terrific. Well, thank you all. Um, we're now going to head into our question and answer session. And for those of you uh, in the audience, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. And we'd ask that you please use that uh, feature in Zoom to submit your question for our panelists today. Uh, again, that's the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, before we start the Q&A, I have a few reminders for everyone. Uh, Energy Plus, our summer webinar series, will return next Thursday at noon with my colleague, Alan Gleckner. He, along with Mar Martha Larson of RMF Engineering, Rose Patzer of Minnesota State Center, Minnesota State Energy Center of Excellence, and Amelia Vose of the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, will discuss the intersection of energy and higher education. Uh, sounds like a good topic for you, Gabe. Um, uh, and while we're on the subject of events, uh, registration is also now open for our virtual benefit breakfast. That's on October 13th this year, featuring Julian Brave Noisecat, a nationally acclaimed journalist and thought leader who has become a force for climate action across movements. Register at fresh-energy.org slash benefit breakfast. And finally, winter is coming. For the first time ever, we have created Fresh Energy branded wool socks, yay, that celebrate wind, solar, and clean energy. Everyone who donates $50 to Fresh Energy by July 31st, 2022 can snag their own pair of lim our limited edition socks. 
And thanks to a generous donor, all gifts will be matched so your contribution is doubled. And with that, we'll now move on to our question and answer session. Remember again, the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen is what we're asking you to use to submit questions. I will do my best to keep an eye on it uh, and filter through questions as we go. Um, we're gonna start though with a question uh, that was submitted by Betsy C. And the question is, what can we do to ensure there are opportunities for low income communities to be activated and engaged with climate uh, and energy initiatives? What are organizations doing and how can organizations better partner with under-resourced communities around climate and energy? Uh, Gabe, do you wanna take a first shot at this? Sure, I think this is a great question. I, I think I first would highlight something that I think Carolina and Dominic both um, emphasize in their points, which is that climate doesn't exist in isolation, that it's linked to other issues. And we think about the opportunities clean energy is creating or the uh, challenges that climate change will create for communities. There's a lot of opportunity to think about multi-issue framing. How does, for example, clean energy link with economic development? This has been a lot of, you know, I think that linkage has been a, a key entry point for a lot of uh, private sector organizations to get involved with clean energy. But there's so many more we can think about. Uh, stewarding the planet has been a key linkage for faith-based organizations to get more engaged in climate policy. I think the list goes on and on about how we can think about this multi-issue framing, but oftentimes it's not so much how can organizations change what they're doing to become clean energy organizations, I think it's instead how to work in that in-between space and find that alignment between what community-based organizations prioritize, what's in their core mission, and how that aligns with clean energy and climate. Uh, Carolina, did you have anything maybe to add on this on this topic? Yeah, just thinking of when the pandemic started, um, Copal started opening a helpline where community members could call and, and get support for anything such as food, home, really anything that they needed at that moment. And one of the biggest questions was how do we how do how to pay for energy bills and, and just things at home. And I think that's something that really caught our attention to say. Once again, I know I will sound like a broken uh, disc, but how do we make information accessible in other languages to inform our, our community of what is available out there in order to pay bills? Um, Something that we have also been doing is we have um, at Copal, we have our own community radio named the Workers Radio. And Monday to Friday, we have programming on different topics, but we do focus on environmental justice and health and the worker center. So there's different topics that we focus on. And some of the uh, programs that we've had are have focused on just this information, how to get information out there. I think it's one thing that as organizations, we have to get creative and find ways to get that information out there to our communities. Sure. So, uh, so great, uh, great answers and a really, uh, a really good question. Um, we have another question uh, that was submitted uh, from an audience member um, are there, are there uh, things that we're currently not doing um, that in our communities maybe we should be? Um, said differently, uh, is there something particularly innovative that other, that's happening elsewhere uh, that we might consider bringing here to Minnesota or doing in Minnesota communities to try to fill uh, gaps? Um, anybody want to take a first stab at that? Very broad question, uh, but but I, I can I can take uh, an attempt at doing it. I, I mean, the short answer is probably is probably yes, right? That there's always more we could be doing, and I don't want to continue to harp on sort of this this partnership, um, you know, point. But thinking back to the previous question as well about reaching different communities, you know, I I think we can always do an increasingly better job about recognizing what our scope of work is and what opportunities we have in working with and building relationships with other organizations and other partners who already hold some of those relationships as well. So if we truly want to reach new audiences or serve people in the most productive way possible for them, um, sometimes it's not going to be us as the direct uh, you know, communicators of those things. But how do we continue 
to work as uh, as a community of organizations who all care about climate and have you know intersectional interests and intersectional uh, identities in order to build the strongest movement possible. Because I think you know across the cross cutting issues, we share a lot of the same values related to the types of lives we want to live. Uh, you know, as Minnesotans. Um, the last thing I would add is like any opportunity you have to embed, uh, you know, voter registration or, you know, democracy uh, resources into your broader programming as you're reaching people and hopefully building membership, becoming members of COPA. Um, but as you're doing those other normal activities, what are the, you know, low lift, low barrier opportunities to embed some of those things in? I'm going to add to this question. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, maybe some specifics about how we think about utility regulation and legislation, which I think are areas where, you know, there's some real power dynamics that I think work uh, in some cases against uh, democratic interest. These are processes that are really complicated. Uh, many of the dockets at the PUC, just the amount of documents and information and models that get used is growing exponentially. That makes it really hard for voters to participate. And so instead, I think the system we've relied on in, in most states, including Minnesota, is to rely on consumer advocates, uh, to rely on state agencies, and to rely on, I think, a lot of nonprofits to do this you know, really deep technical work to create some amount of parity between uh, the, the interests of the utility, uh, particularly when they uh, are misaligned with the public interest or not in perfect alignment. And that kind of deliberative space is, is really challenging. But also, I think there's a lot of things that other states are doing to try to create more parity or to prioritize the public interest in those deliberate spaces. I think about things like intervener compensation programs. We have a program like that in Minnesota, but it's really hard to use. I think empowering uh, the actual regulatory staff to make um, more, uh, I think, have more capacity to engage. And our Public Utility Commission, according to our own budget office, has a significantly lower budget than comparable states. And I think also funding uh, more uh, to uh, researchers and analysts that can uh, do the work solely in the name of the public interest. I think about the um, example in New York of uh, NYSERDA, which does work and has a huge amount of staff, employs tons of researchers to do modeling and technical work uh, in the public interest accountable to a board uh, that I think has more of that built-in democratic structure uh, than I think we have uh, in our setup here. And just, just really quickly, something I think we are not doing enough of is really simplifying the very complex um, topics. I feel like a lot of the times we tend to use language that is really complicated. And um, I mean, for people that have been doing this for, you know, do this every day, it's normal. But I feel like, you know, our community, how do we simplify it? How do we uh, make it more understandable for our community to, to get engaged? I, I think it's important and sometimes we tend to forget that. So I think that's something that we should do more, just simplify things a little bit more. Great. Um, so we have, uh, I'm going to try to get one more question in. I know we're about at time. Um, so we're going to go over just for a few minutes. Uh, and I understand if folks need to drop off uh, as it is one o'clock. Um, but there's a couple of questions in the chat that are specifically about cities. Um, and it, you know, I think that, I don't think that's a coincidence when you think about cities and the role of local government, that's really the front lines of democracy for a lot of folks. And uh, for a lot of us where government touches our daily lives the most. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, put, a, put, put these questions together a little bit and just ask more generally, um, from your different perspectives, um, what do you all see as um, opportunities and challenges that are unique to local government? Um, and related to that, um, any sort of best practices or advice you might have for cities and city leaders as they think about their role um, kind of as frontline representatives of our, uh, our, our democratic government. Um, whoever wants to take that first. Um, maybe I can... I'll call on Gabe. <laughs> I'll, I'll just jump in really quick. Sorry, Gabe. Okay, go, um, go for it. I, I do need to jump in just a minute here. Um, I, I think one of the big challenges that I've always seen in, in cities, and I, I'll lump counties into this as well, is that it's tough sometimes for people just to understand what they do. 
that you know they have an understanding of a city council person or a mayor, but fully understanding what's under the scope and jurisdiction and how much really can be done at the city level. Um, like finding us finding a way and cities finding a way to actually be clearer about um, what power and then what levers they actually have their hands on could go a huge way towards inspiring people to move to make changes um, you know, within that jurisdiction. And uh, having worked in government, you know, sometimes people come with certain requests, rightfully, they're like, this is just not what we do at this level of government. But if we can be more forthcoming about this is exactly what we do at this level of government, I think the level of creativity, the level of activity um, in general would increase. Let's just give a quick shout out to the uh, Frank Jossie article from two days ago, um, looking at uh, I think a dozen or so different uh, Minnesota cities that are developing climate action plans. And a couple of things that stood out to me from that article was I think cities oftentimes need to, you know, unless you're a big city like, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, Rochester, you need technical support. And I think that a lot of that um, is becoming available through, you know, shout out to my colleagues at the U at the Clean Energy Resource Teams. Uh, helping to build some of that capacity, but I think also other programs um, like Green Step City all kind of help to build some of that momentum and share capacity across cities so that action can be local, but capacity can be built collaboratively. Well, great. Well, thank you so much again uh, to our panels and uh, apologies to folks uh, if you didn't get your questions in. We are a little over time, um, so I think we're going to go ahead and um, conclude our conversation there. Um, on behalf of everyone here at Fresh Energy, uh, I want to thank you all for attending part one of our Energy Plus webinar series, uh, and thank you especially to our panelists, Gabe, Dominic, and Carolina, and to Senator Klobuchar and Secretary Simon, of course, as well. A recording of this webinar will be posted at fresh-energy.org slash publications, and on our podcast, Decarbonize, the Clean Energy Podcast, which is available on all podcasting apps. You can learn more about Fresh Energy's work at www.fresh-energy.org. Here you can subscribe to our newsletter, check out the latest on our blog, and of course, uh, if you're so inclined, make a donation. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you next Thursday. <laughs>